Good morning, friends. As you've already heard, we are in the season of Advent. And this, of course, is a time of expectation. And so the, uh, the thought I want us to have in our minds is from that story from Luke chapter 7. In verse 19, we are faced with this question, Are you he, or are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? Do you know the experience of uh, having certain expectations about someone, and then being surprised, or even disappointed and shocked, when you actually meet the person? The great moment of meeting arrives, and almost automatically as they appear before you, you have to start changing your expectations. They are much taller, or shorter, or fatter, or thinner than you thought. What a booming voice they have, or what a, what a squeaky voice they have. Or even more significantly, as you get to know the person, you, you discover qualities of character, uh, or the lack of character. My, what an enormous ego, or, or, or what a workaholic. Or oh, I've never met anyone with such integrity, and so on, and so on. The point is that we, we get to know people, but very often we have to change our expectations of them as we get to know them better. We have a preconceived or prejudiced or unrealistic picture, but once we meet them and get to know them, we begin to discover the real person. It takes a bit of time also takes some openness and honesty. And this is our Advent theme. For the coming of Christ was expected by many, it had been expected for, for many centuries. And yet when he came, people were surprised. Some were disappointed at the Messiah. In John's Gospel, we, we, we read that uh, there was a public debate about Jesus. Can he be the one? Surely not, some said. So they looked at him and they, they doubted and they had to change their expectations. And here in Luke's Gospel, we see some of the private doubts that even John the Baptist, who knew Jesus very well, who had grown up with Jesus, he expected a judge who would punish and destroy the wicked, but here is Jesus spreading love and forgiveness all over the place. You can see John scratching his head. Well, I don't know. This is not the kind of Messiah I expected. So, some were surprised, disappointed, but the wise people looked and listened for God's plan and they changed their expectations. Someone has said, God can surprise us, but He will never disappoint us. God can surprise us, but He will never disappoint us. And so when we are honestly looking for Him, we will find Him and recognize Him, and we will discover that our expectations were wrong, that He is greater and better than our expectations. They expected another Jewish nationalist leader and when he came they were confronted with a saviour, the saviour of the world. So look at, at how they had to change their expectations. Firstly he, he turned out to be much more human than they expected. You see there was an end of the world crowd who expected a sort of macho, supernatural, Rambo-type Superman, Messiah. Someone who would come from the clouds. And then there were the nationalists, and they expected a political leader who would develop a military, or even a terrorist force, and lead a rebellion against Rome. And then there were the religious types, they were expecting a sort of super-Pharisee, a conservative, 
devoted to imposing the law of Moses on everyone. And of course they were all surprised. They were very disappointed. Here he came, a simple baby, born in a mountain cave of a poor peasant family, a workman from lowly and somewhat ungodly Nazareth. He was too ordinary, too human, too common for their liking. He was not really holy enough. He was not powerful enough. He was not grand enough for their liking. But again, for those who were wise and who looked, there was something, there was something unique about Jesus. We beheld his glory, says John. And God's glory turned out to be more human and down to earth than we think. People strain themselves to find God in all sorts of exceptional or fantastic events. They seek signs, they swap religions and churches, they join sects and communes, they create dictatorial charismatic leaders, they seek exotic spiritual experiences, and yet he unveils his glory on our doorstep, in the commonplace things of home and family and friends and work and health and sickness and babies and hobbies. Jesus came to tell us that if you're looking for God, look first of all at human life, at ordinary commonplace people, for you will find him there. A young man was, uh, was talking to an older priest and the priest was sitting at his desk. He had his diary or his journal open in front of him into which he'd been writing his thoughts and his reflections, uh, his appointments, his chores, his duties. The man asked, is that just an ordinary diary uh, then? Um, it's not about your spiritual life, is it? The priest thought a while and then he answered very gently, this diary is my spiritual life. The lists I have to work through every day. The jobs I have to do every day. The ordinary things I do from hour to hour. The interviews, the interruptions. This is my spiritual life. My diary informs my devotions. I pray my lists. We all have lists. And we're going to have more lists in the next few weeks. I pray my lists, can we say. And Jesus was human like that. His glory shone through from hour to hour in the ordinary. And then second, he was a much more generous Messiah than they wanted. That sounds strange. But their expectation was of a Messiah for themselves, for the chosen people. But Christ shocked them by showing that he had come not only for the Jews, but also for the Greeks, and for the Romans, and for all Gentiles and especially for the down and out. He wasn't going to be exclusively for the Jews. He was going to be inclusive towards everyone. For God loved not just the Jews, but the world. And he had come for the world. He had been sent for the world. Now we've all known that rather selfish, jealous feeling of wanting someone for ourselves. Perhaps it was a friend, or a visiting relative, or a business colleague, and we wanted to monopolize their time. But they wanted to see and to meet other people. And we felt maybe put out, maybe rejected, maybe unloved. And of course we had to grow up. We like to think of ourselves as the center of the universe. 
with everyone and even God orbiting around us. But what Jesus taught was that God is the center of the universe, the center of all things, and that his generous love reaches out to everyone. That God has no favorites, that he hates exclusiveness, whereby some are kept out. He hates all forms of snobbery, and he showed this in his attitude to Samaritans, to sinners like the adulterous woman, to tax collectors like Zacchaeus, to untouchables like the leper. Lepers. Jesus challenges us to change our expectations. If we were expecting a private saviour and a sort of private Christianity, then we will be surprised and discomforted and challenged by the worldwide, all-embracing, inclusive love of God. A love not just for us, but for our rival, our competitor, and Jesus said, even our enemy. And then, thirdly, he was a much more compassionate figure than they expected. Now we have John the Baptist having his own doubts about Jesus. He expected someone different. Being in prison, John sends messengers to Jesus. Um, and the question he asks is a very blunt one. Are you he? Are you the one who is to come? Or shall we look for another? And Jesus said to, to John's messengers, Go and tell John what you see and what you hear. Put the evidence before them. Look at the fruits of my ministry. Here is some scientific, verifiable evidence. The blind recover their sight. Not only physically, but also spiritually. For Christ takes the film from our eyes and we can really see for the first time the truth about ourselves, our fellows and God. The lame walk. Yes, cripples picked up their beds, but also the aimless and the listless. Uh, they became strong and vital again. The lepers are cleansed. Yes, indeed, but also those who felt like lepers, those who felt untouchable, inferior, guilty, and rejected, they knew Christ's healing touch, and they began a new life. The deaf here, a miracle, yes, but a bigger miracle was that we can now hear God. We can hear God speaking. We can now hear one another speaking, our neighbours, our family, where before we were indifferent or we were just plain deaf. And the dead are raised to life. Yes, there were, was more than one such miracle, one just encountered in our reading. But also the living dead are raised to life. The dead who won't fall down, as someone once said. Those who lacked meaning and purpose and direction and a reason for living. Those have been reborn and discovered a new life. And lastly, the last bit of evidence he offered was the poor are hearing good news. You see, only the poor would have good news because the true Messiah would take the poor seriously. False prophets were on the side of the powerful, the wealthy, the greedy and the evil, but the Son of God came for the poor and the lost. And in any case, everyone is poor who has not heard the good news. Go back to John, said Jesus, tell John all this. He expected a mighty judge who would punish and destroy and get people into line. 
and tell him to shape up. Let him consider these works of mine and he will be greatly blessed if he can accept them. If he's not embarrassed or scandalized by me. And so even John the Baptist's expectations had to change. Wonderful as his hopes had been, here was something different, even more wonderful, much more compassion and grace than he'd expected. Jesus' work is not to destroy, but to heal, not to punish, but to forgive, not to bring death, but rather life. And so we go back to the gospel story for today, the raising of the widow's son. They were in a village just uh, south of Nazareth, a little place called Nain. A funeral procession was taking place. There were many tears. The funeral was for a young man, the only son of a widow. So there were the mourners and there were the wailers who were trying to empathize with the family. There were those who had spices for the preparation of the body. They were heading for a, a family burial plot outside the town. And then suddenly these strangers arrive. A man leading a small group of followers. He's looking at the widowed and who now is a doubly bereaved mother. And something inside him seems to be stirring. He comes up to them and he says something to her. Very simple. Don't cry. He said to her, and then to everyone's surprise and horror, he touches the beer. Nobody would normally do that, because it makes them unclean. And then the biggest shock of all, he's telling the boy to get up. Young fellow, I'm telling you, get up. And the whole funeral procession goes wild with astonishment and disbelief. They don't know which one to look at. The no longer dead boy, the amazed mother, or this stranger who has done what the old prophets, Elijah and Elisha, used to do. God has visited his people, they say. God has visited his people in the old biblical sense where this phrase was used to refer to God visiting Israel. Visiting God in, in, in other great events. It means God has come near to us. To save us. To rescue us. It means God is a God of compassion and grace. It means this is the time we've been waiting for. Now I want you to use your imaginations and go through the scene again. Instead of it being a funeral procession, uh, in a small first century Galilean town, make it the moment you most dread in this coming week or in this coming year. Maybe it's something you know is going to happen, like a traumatic move of a house or a job. Maybe it's something you're always afraid of, a sudden accident or illness or tragedy or a scandal, come into the scene if you can in prayer. Feel its sorrow and its frustration, its bitterness, its fear, its anger. And then watch as Jesus comes to join you in the middle of it. Take time in prayer and let him approach, let him speak, let him touch, let him command. He may not say what you expect. He may not do what you want. But if his presence comes to you, uh, then that is what you most need. Once he is in the middle of it all with you, you will be able to come through it. Because God will have visited you.
Who does Jesus think he is? Who do we think Jesus is? Are you he? Are you the one who is to come? Or shall we look for another? We say he is the one. Near to us, among us, visiting us, saving us, rescuing us completely human, amazingly generous, deeply compassionate. At a church conference, an elderly minister was uh, spotted in the crowd and asked to come up to the platform to open with a prayer. It was quite a spontaneous prayer. And fortunately, it, it was recorded. And this is how he, he ended his prayer. I wonder if you know him. Well, this is my king. He is the king. His grace is sufficient. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. I wish I could describe him to you, but he's indescribable. He's indescribable. Yes, he is. He's God. He's indescribable, he's incomprehensible, he's invisible, he's irresistible. You can't get him out of your mind. You can't get him off your hand. You can't outlive him and you can't live without him. The Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. The witnesses couldn't get their testimonies to agree. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him. And the grave couldn't hold him. That's my king. That's my king. And thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever and ever and ever. How long is that? And ever and ever. And when you get through all the forevers, then Amen. Amen and Amen. This is the good news for today and we thank God for it. Amen. Now we move to sharing communion.